Good afternoon, my name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio, here to welcome you to today's Practice Innovation Workshop Series program, Elevating Design, Collaboration to ele Elevate Your Practice. This is the fourth in a series of six workshops focused on practice innovation that we presented by AI Ohio this year. First, I would like to recognize and thank our 2021 AI Ohio annual sponsors highlighted on the screen now. Our sponsors are important partners who have helped us bring this innovative and quality programming that you are enjoying this year. I would also like to thank our Practice Innovation Committee Chair, Melinda Scarfello, and committee members, Emily Little, Bruce Sikanik, Bill Willoughby, and Kate Brunswick for developing the programs for this series. There is a lot of work that goes into these sessions and they would not be possible without this group of dedicated volunteers. So don't forget to register for the final two practice innovation series sessions at AIOhio.org. We're all looking forward to next week's Architecture and Wonderland, We're All Mad Here, and our final session, Innovative Technologies Reshaping Practice. Registration opens today for the AI Ohio member recognition celebration to recognize this year's honor award recipients and the contributions of AI Ohio's members to the profession. The event will take place in Columbus on the evening of November 4th. This will be our only in-person event for the year. Seating is limited, so don't wait until the last minute to register. Uh, before we get started, there's just a few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled to be one and one half hours, including some time at the end for Q&A. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. Please make sure your microphone is on mute so that everyone can also hear. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, we'll be placing a link in the chat box that you can click on to sign up and receive learning units for today's program. So today's featured speakers are Paul Herbert, AIA with the Cambridge 7, Peter McRae, AIA with McRae Architecture, LLC, and Greg Strollo with Axiom Architects, LLC. Charlie Setterfield, AIA, will be moderating the session today for us. Charlie's an Associate Professor of Architecture Technology at Sinclair Community College in Dayton, Ohio, and serves as Dayton's Director on the AI Ohio Board. Thank you all for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Charlie to introduce the presenters for today's program. Charlie? Great. Thank you, Karen. As firm location continues to have a smaller impact on the selection of design professionals, greater opportunities exist for practices to expand their reach through collaboration. While sometimes looked at as a threat to local firms, especially smaller practices, collaborative arrangements provide opportunities to expand firm reach and increase a firm's market position. Through networking, large and small firms alike can benefit from a sharing of information and processes. Here are the learning objectives that were approved by AIA for this session. Today's presentation explores the work of several firms who have embraced collaboration in different ways. Each, each use collaboration to elevate their practice and to enhance their firm's abilities in both design and marketing. A video of this presentation will be posted to the AIA Ohio website, www.aiaohio.org, under About AI Ohio 2021 Programs tab, Practice Innovation Series. The videos are at the bottom of the page. Now I would like to introduce today's presenters. First up will be Paul Herbert, AIA, from Cambridge, Cambridge 7 Group, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Working as an architect, exhibit designer, and project manager on numerous challenging academic, cultural, and commercial projects, Paul Herbert has developed a great deal of experience with internal circulation, accessibility, adjacencies, and coordination of systems. Mr. Herbert joined Cambridge 7 in 2005 after gaining experience in New York and Boston. He was named senior associate in 2017. Our second presenter will be Peter McRae, AIA, from McRae Architecture in Columbus, Ohio. Peter S. McRae, AIA, has 44 years of experience in the architectural profession and is licensed as an architect in 38 states. He is principal of McRae Architecture, LLC, and Peter's focus is on the acquisition and design of strategically planned, environmentally branded design projects. Peter's projects have won numerous national design awards and have been featured in a variety of trade publications. Peter serves as chair of the leadership group for the AIA Practice Management Knowledge Community. He was recently published in multiple industry trade journals for having created a national full-service virtual architectural practice model. 
Peter was selected as a presenter on the subject at the AIA 2020 AIA National Convention in Los Angeles and the 2019 AIA National Convention in Las Vegas. Peter has also taught environmental branding at the Knowlton School of Architecture at The Ohio State University. And our third presenter will be Greg Strollo, AIA, from Axiom Architects, LLC, in Youngstown, Ohio. Greg has been the principal architect on over 2,250 projects worth over $3 billion during his more than 40-year career. His areas of ex experience include program analysis, planning, design, and ADA compliance. His portfolio includes work for some of the region's largest, most demanding, and quality-conscious clientele. Mr. Strollo has typically been team leader on public projects, recognizing the fiduciary roles and responsibilities of elected public officials. Greg is a past president of AIA Ohio and is also president of Strollo Architects in Youngstown. And with that, thank you to all of our presenters for doing this. And I would like to turn it over to Paul Herbert, AIA of Cambridge 7. All right, well, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen here, Let's see if this works. Okay, does that look right? Does everyone see my camera seven slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, so my name is Paul Herbert. I'm a senior associate at Cambridge Seven, and um, so I'm just. I was thinking, what I do here is just give you a little intro into Cambridge Seven. We're kind of a unique firm, and then to talk about a couple projects and use those two projects to tell a couple stories about how we collaborate in many different ways, um, and how we found that um, we're constantly trying to be flexible and trying to understand or keep an open mind about how we how we do team. So. We're a firm that's about 65. So we like to think of ourselves as a medium-sized firm. We're located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, we do a lot of different types of work. We started back in the 60s, or the firm did, for my time, with the uh, New England Aquarium. And that was the first thing we had done. And that kind of aquarium work kind of made us famous. So we traveled all over the world doing aquariums to start. That's how the firm started. Um, since then, we have um, branched out quite a bit. So we still do the museum work. We still do a lot of museums, science museums, children's museums, um, a lot of aquarium work, that kind of stuff. But we also do academic work, hospitality work, and transportation work, work in all these different sectors. And we think that or believe that we learn by, you know, the people in our office are working in all those different studios at all different times. There's no kind of hard walls between any studios. Everyone bounces around. And then we think that we, we benefit from doing, you know, academic learning spaces, our children's museums gain, you know, benefit from that experience. And so we do a lot of different things throughout the office, and it's kind of always changing. We also do a lot of exhibit work. Um, and so when we do exhibits, we do the actual interactive elements inside museums. And so on the top left here, you see cultural, we do cultural museums, history museums, where we're telling stories and getting, you know, history to be fun for kids. We do a lot of aquariums, as I mentioned, and then science museums. So like a little bit of an age, you know, older kid uh, age group of science interaction. And then in the bottom right, we're also showing, doing a lot of work in children's museums, actually more and more now. And uh, it's really fun, you know, this designing spaces for the youngest learners um, and creating fun environments for them. And so I thought I would show a couple of org charts. We're talking about collaboration. Cambridge 7, because we're both architects and exhibit designers, we find ourselves kind of in different places all the time. So on the left here, this is a museum project that we went after when we put this org chart together and it was, you know, not too far from our office. And we were like, okay, we're going to be the lead architect. We can be the lead exhibit designer. We can be the kind of the big, big bubble at the top, right? That's how, and we can have all this consultants that are working for us and working with us. Um, but not all the projects we go after are like that. And so um, this is a, a project that we are currently working on in the org chart and we're down at the very bottom, bottom left. Um, and we're in this case, we're just the exhibit designer. And as the exhibit designer, we're doing things working with other architects, working with fabricators, actually the fabricators above us here um, in this branch. So we actually are a sub to the fabricator in this case. Um, and for exhibits, we call them fabricators. Um, for architecture, they're called contractors, kind of the same thing as the builder. And then, um, so yeah, so we're down there next to Boss Display, which if you guys don't know Boss, they're the water table. They're kind of famous for making water tables. So that's us. And we're kind of bouncing all over the place. And we find that that usually is kind of fun. You know, we, we kind of try to keep an open mind and we go into all of our projects 
um, trying to figure out what's the best way to kind of approach this project. Um, being children's museums, science museums, most of the work that I personally work on, we're traveling all over the place because you know most cities have kind of one of those things, um, not a bunch. And so a lot of our work is all over the country and we find ourselves kind of figuring it out every time to kind of figure out what's the right team to put together. And so I'm gonna show a couple projects here um, and I'm gonna start with the Oh Wow Children's Science Center in Youngstown, Ohio. And this is a, a project that we worked with go. Philip Sekinik Architects um, on. And when we went after this, project we uh were the um going after the architecture and exhibit design it was kind of a smaller project we thought we could do both in this case it's it was all during the pandemic it started in june i think or july when we went to the interview and it opened of, of 2020 and it opened um in 2021 in may of 2021 so it was um a kind of a quick project small project and we're like we can do this however we weren't actually going to be there. So after we put this team together, we were like, how can we get a team that's, you know, really going to be able to get there? And so we worked with these firms like Wish Janey, um, who maybe you guys all know, they're a firm that has, you know, offices all over the country. And so they have one in Cincinnati. So we thought as structural and acoustical, that would be perfect. Have them part of the team and have someone part of their team close to us in Boston and close to them, uh, to the museum. Same as AKF, they have uh, offices all over the country. And we wanted to think about how can we use them and, and they had done some work in Cincinnati and we knew that from our experience with them. And so we reached out to them and they said that for that work in Cincinnati, they worked with a company called Moats Engineering, who maybe some of you guys know. And, and so even they teamed up with somebody local, even though we were kind of teaming up with um, local people. And after we got that project or we got the call back after the interview, they said that they wanted someone to be a local architect, to know the local environment, to understand the market, to understand how the building permitting process and all of that goes. And, and we needed to find somebody near Youngstown, Ohio. It turns out the principal in charge um, of a project here was Peter Kuttner, who is a, in the in FAIA. He, through his networking with AIA and FAIA, met Bruce Sekinik. Um, and so we reached out to them and they were, I think maybe 10 or 15 minutes from the museum. So it really made perfect sense. And they were kind of as local as it could be. Um, and it turned out to be a huge benefit to our team to kind of share that with them and bring them in and get them involved. In, and same with all the other consultants. One of the, or a couple key parts of the project that we benefited from having um, partnered with Philip Sekinik or PSA was that the part of this building, the design of the project was to reorient the entire first floor. They had two street front, street fronts. And the one that was the current um, entrance was on a busy street. And then this back door was on the plaza and they wanted to put their front door here. So they wanted to flip their whole first floor. So that meant going through, even though we had a short window and a tight budget, we were trying to figure out how to go through that whole process of going to the city and going through the proper design review boards. And, um, and Bruce actually, uh, Bruce Sekinik, who was the partner or the principal in charge from PSA, he helped us walk through that whole process. He had a bunch of experience with it. I mean, it was, there's no way we could have done it without having the right kind of team put together. Um, and so this is now their front door. This is what it looks like after the renovation was done. And of course, all of the punch listing was done by PSA. Everything on site was done by PSA throughout the entire construction. Um, we were getting lots of photos and kind of working remotely with them, but um, that partner to this project, you know, having that collaboration was um, crucial to pull this all off. Um, and then there's a couple other things that actually turned out to be really important too, which was they, there was a tight budget and this was a client that wanted to use as much as they could of what they had, use it in a way that kind of refresh it, make it exciting. And so in this case, the, 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 oh, wow logo on the top, right. And the colorful letters, that was a sign. It's hard to see here, but it's something like 12 or 13 feet long. Um, but they wanted to, we wanted to reuse that and to be able to like, go through the process of measuring it, getting it down off there, thinking about telling the contractor where to put it and all that stuff was a very um, crucial thing that PSA did on site most, mostly we and, and kind of informed us along the way. In this image, you can see the new, new lobby renovation. That sign is now on the wall inside the museum as part of the retail. 
And so as you enter the new entrance, you're experiencing some of the old entrance um, and, and everything here you see is, is you know, part of this collaboration that the team really worked together to pull off. The other part to this project was an exhibit design portion. Now they decided late that they wanted to kind of add this and they wanted to collaborate with another museum. So there's two museums in this case. The one is the House of Shine down in um, Texas and the Oh Wow partnered with them and wanted to bring this exhibit up here. So we started working as exhibit designers with their exhibit designers and graphic designers and working with kind of how to transform their exhibits, which are they have a very specific message and how they want to get it into this space in a very, very short window. So we worked with them um, to do all that and we worked all of it remotely. Um, and eventually uh, we had this exhibit design was ready to go and, and we needed to get a fabricator to come in and kind of finish it off and install it. And it kind of became a little design build effort. Now we knew time-wise we needed to find somebody who could do it fast. Um, and so we wanted somebody that wasn't too far away and somebody that we had that we knew. Um, and so we brought Exhibits, uh, which is a fabrication company um, and they're up in Michigan. And so it was like, I think it was like a four and a half hour drive for them or something to get there. And so when we brought them in, they said it was very kind of like, you know, it's a tight window and a tight budget. We're not sure if this is gonna go well. And, and we, it was a really tight window. And so we were, you know, hopeful and we worked really hard. Everyone worked together and, and did pull this off. And actually after this process, after going through that process with them and then telling us that they had a great experience with us and a great experience with the museum and kind of how the whole project went, um, they asked us to join a project um, that they were working on. So they were working on, as a fabricator, they were taking over, uh, or they were doing a huge museum in uh, Flint, Michigan. And so the Sloan Museum, uh, was something they were already working with, but the exhibit designer had uh, some disagreements, I think, with the, the museum and they left the picture. And so exhibits was left trying to find somebody to bring somebody in kind of in a shorter window than you'd ever, you know, in a tighter budget. And we'd pull off the exhibit design for this whole uh, Discovery Hall gallery. And so because of our experience with them and because we brought them in and, and working with them, um, they reached out to us and said, hey, you, you want to join us on this one now. And so now we're working on this. This is a rendering from last week. We're working through DD now, working with them. So, so even, you know, everyone you work with, even if it's a contractor or something, we've always found that like that kind of circles around and everybody gets to know everybody. And even when it's the kind of national picture, um, there's people that we run into all the time. And so that's just one um, story that came directly out of that. And I thought it was pretty interesting, but so I have one other project that has a, a kind of a key series of um, relationships that, that kind of work with it and I wanted to share. So this is a project called Port Wonder. It's a children's museum and a nature center. It's in Louisiana. So it's in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, I want to say it's about two hours west of New Orleans. We have as a firm worked in New Orleans, a, a couple of different projects, and we worked on a children's museum in Baton Rouge. Um, and after we had uh, finished that, and then this, the city had the idea that they wanted to redo the waterfront. They wanted to bring the, their children's museum into a new building on the water. Um, they had experience with the Baton Rouge and so museum. So they reached out to us and they said, hey, you know, we like your work and we want you to come down. And so we interviewed for this children's museum um and when and we won this and so we were really excited now at the at the time they had an architect on board and he had done some renderings um some early concept renderings um before we were involved um and so we you know we knew it was going to be kind of a unique situation how we were gonna you know we, we market ourselves as both architects and exhibit designers we do both and we believe that the museum is better off when those two things work together for to create those experiences. Um, and so we kind of, you know, we went in trying to figure out how do we how do we potentially position ourselves here to do architecture and exhibits or work with the architect to do um, some portion of it. And actually, we did come up with a great experience uh, kind of relationship. So they did have an architect and they said we'd still like him to be involved. And so they're kind of a smaller firm. Um, and we said, okay, that's great. So we met with them. And then essentially we were tasked, the two of us with, how do we make this work? How do we split it up? And so what we did 
was we put um, the decided to we wanted to split the um, phases with them. So we were going to do some of the um, exhibit. We're going to do all the exhibit design, but we were going to do some of the uh, architecture. We we're going to do schematic design and design development. And then we were going to hand it to them to do um, the CDs and the CA and, and, and kind of take it from that, from that end of the museum. So to make sure both firms were always involved in every phase, we decided to split all of those phases a little bit. So even during schematic design, they would have like 15% of the fee for schematic design and they would come to the meetings and they would be involved in the discussions. And then when it got into CDs, um, which is, is currently, we have like 15% of the fee. So we would essentially be um, involved in all the meetings and helping them push through the coordination issues and some of that stuff as they do the construction documents. And so by involving everyone in every phase, we really felt like we could be a team up front where you know we front load it and think about how do we work it through the whole process. So some of the collaboration besides with the local architect um, has evolved throughout the different needs for each of these projects. And so on the right, in the pink is the children's museum area and on the left is the green which is the nature center and so the nature center is almost an aquarium you can see all the light blue in there those are all different tanks um, and, and interactive uh, aquarium inter, um, experiences and so we have a series of different um, you know team members joining this team to make it all work one of them is our graphic designer um, so this if you remember the curve of the roof as i go to this next slide our graphic designer who's involved with kind of the early discussions and some of the early um, con conceptual design idea meetings and stuff. She is a firm, a small firm. Um, I think it's just her and one other. Uh, they're out in Colorado and we met her years ago. She used to actually work at Cambridge 7 for about a year, about eight years ago or seven years ago. And, and then she went off and started her own firm. And we go back to her all the time whenever we have graphic design projects that are kind of too big for us to handle in our office. We'll do little projects because um, we have one or two graphic designers, but something like this. And so these are her, um, some of her intro panels to the different areas in the nature center. And so she's using her the kind of little bit of a notion of the architectural form. And she's kind of bringing through all the colors that we're talking about into all of the things that she's doing. Um, and so Natalie has been kind of key to the team in terms of thinking about how people experience the space um, and what they learn about in these spaces. And so that, and then these are some of the examples of her panels that are um, the different areas, the different gallery panels in the, uh, as you move through the nature center. And so she's working with the client now to kind of get the final photos and the final content. Um, but, you know, having her involved in the conversation has made, has allowed us to kind of really have a totally integrated experience where everything from what you see, what you touch um, in the museum and it all works together. The other part is the LSS, which is in our case, in this case, an aquarium project, that's the life support systems. And so whenever you're dealing with live animal habitats, we have um, a series of spaces behind the scenes where we have quarantine tanks and holding tanks and salt water mixing tanks and all these things that support the things that are on display um, in, the, in, the, in the nature center proper. Um, we're working with Aiken LSS Design and Engineering. So this is a drawing that he's put together, that his company put together. And this is what's behind the, so those blue areas are our tanks. The blue air circle on the left, those are, those are inside the back of house. Those are things that are um, part of the support system that goes with the tanks that are out on display. And so there's a lot of stuff going on back here. Um, and this relationship with Andy, how we started to collaborate with Andy at Andy Aiken LSS Design was actually, um, oh, and this is, so this is a picture of like one of our other projects where we have LSS and this, you know, making this behind the scenes work for the museum is really important for them as well as what we're doing for the, you know, the visitor on the front side of this experience. But these pictures are from the National Aquarium in Baltimore. This is the Black Tip Reef, Black Tip Reef exhibit. So we did a renovation of the tray tank, which is the tank, the tank at the bottom, which is the tray underneath um, all the visitors. And it used to be a stingray tank, if you've been there. In the last few years, it's now been, it's now a Black Tip Reef Shark exhibit. And 
Andy, we met Andy Aiken because Andy is the um, LSS, the husbandry, they call it the LSS designer and um, director at the National Aquarium. He works there every day, all day. He runs all these exhibits at the National Aquarium and, and his, um, his role there as a um, running this day-to-day, -day, having that experience really brings that uh, level of knowledge and confidence to our clients now that they can say, oh, so your teammate is actually running these tanks and running these systems. And we can say yes, you know, on a great, um, to even a bigger scale sometimes. Um, and so that, you know, collaboration that we have from a previous client, even as we bring people back in and kind of always being open to how you get there and, and who you might work with in the past and where you're headed in the future. Um, and then we have the, you know, the little, um, one plus one equals three. Well, we, we switch it to say one plus one equals seven. We kind of always believe that when we, when you bring us on a team or on a project, we're, we're always going to collaborate and it's always going to come out to be better than just the, the individuals involved. And so, you know, we always kind of try to stay flexible. We approach the projects as a way to, um, evolve our thinking about how we think about collaboration, where we collaborate, um, and making sure that, the real benefit is the end users, the people in, the, in these museums that really get to see that um, uh, expertise come through. So, so that's all I have uh, for now. And I guess I will throw it back to Charlie to pass it on. Great, thank you, Paul. Those are really interesting collaborative projects. Thanks for sharing those. Um, next up is Peter. And um, while he's sharing his screen, I just wanna point out that he's presenting not only on his own behalf, but on the behalf of Jennifer Crutcher of Jake Crutcher Architect in Los Gatos, California, and Leah Bayer, Bayer of OJK Architecture in Palo Alto, California. Can you see my screen yet? Yes, we are good. Very good. Okay. So, um, uh, many of you in Ohio have seen part of this, but I promise you there's some new stuff too, so hang in there. Uh, again, my name is Peter McCray, uh, and my firm is uh, McCray Architecture LLC, and for 10 years we've been 100% uh, uh, virtual uh, uh, with a national practice, and uh, in the intro, you heard that environmental branding is kind of our thing. So resiliency for architecture firms, huh? Well, in our case, it's all about collaboration because that's what virtual practice is. So our practice is located just inside Columbus, uh, inside the Beltway within the northern suburban city of Worthington, for those of you that know Columbus. And I'm going to speak to you today about the origin current manifestation of my virtual architectural practice model. The firm's a thriving high production design firm that delivers architecture, interior design, graphic design, as well as project management and 3D modeling services to clients in commercial, residential, and institutional markets nationally via teams of collaborating contractors, and I remain its only employee. Uh, my career path was relatively traditional for 30 plus years. That all changed in 2011 when to start my own practice, I parted ways with my previous company where I had served as president and partner after it was ravaged by the Great Recession. My goal was to start a firm without any seed cash. I thought it possible to have a full service national architecture practice with zero fixed overhead. No rent, no equipment, no payroll, just a laptop with everything located in the cloud, delivered with a collaborative team, and it's worked like a charm. The first thing I did was talk to my attorney and accountant, having 38 state licenses through my NCARB certification certainly was a huge asset. After establishing the Legal and Financial Foundation, I then set out to collect a flexible and talented staff. So I set up a small office in my home with a laptop and a Wi-Fi connection. In building my firm of independent consultants, I had a ready-made talent pool composed of good employees that my firm had laid off after it dwindled uh, because of the recession from approximately 20 people down to six, four partners and only two staff, totally unsustainable. 
Two years after starting the practice, the pool of potential participants increased with the passing of the Affordable Care Act, lifting the worry of high health care premiums from our collab uh, collaborating contractors. The entire practice is cloud-based, therefore we do not have to buy and maintain servers, expensive programs or equipment, it's all paperless, stored and retrieved virtually. I can complete most of my work with a cell phone and a laptop, and we use a local print shop to sign, seal, and overnight deliver drawings. I was 58 years old when I had the idea of practicing architecture virtually, and as IT challenged as I am, if I can do this, anybody can. Uh, but the virtual architectural practice model is much more than working remotely. My collaborators are all independent consultants. The architecture project team selection is driven by the project's unique requirements for talent in design, project management, CAD, etc. I treated the virtual architectural practice as a design problem and began to think of the firm model as being diagrammatically similar to the World Wide Web with its many nodes and Uber connectivity. In the case of my company, I conceived of this World Wide Web diagram as a grayed out globe, then imagined a new project floating above the surface with its unique requirements for nodes of design and technical talent all driven by the project program and its associated relationship connections between the talent nodes to successfully complete the work. These project specific talent nodes along with their problem mandated interconnectivity light up and the project team thus activated completes the work. Then the project moves on and the nodes retreat back down into the gray black uh, background, a new project follows and passes over the surface and a new project team is similarly assembled. As with all businesses, cash flow is king. Most successful businesses find ways to establish a constant reliable influx of income. And I wanted to discern a way to achieve this in a national architectural practice. So what might be architectural cash flow work? Well, in our case, it ended up being a combination of retail and restaurant prototype rollout work, as well as design, build, tenant improvements, all work that required little marketing and principal management. A stable, dependable cash flow combined with strong financial discipline allows the company to operate just fine without ever having had to acquire a line of credit from a bank. Today, our company is composed of six teams, five of which are headed by a mid-career professional, and these team managers are located in five different states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, and Georgia, and seven different cities. Teams one through four serve national restaurant accounts. Team five does interior TI work for corporate regional headquarters on the behalf of a large international conglomerate. Team six, however, does one-of-a-kind projects for a variety of clients and building types. I personally manage this team. Why? Because I can, and it's the fun stuff. <clears throat> there are no employees. All collaborators are independent contractors who I have mentored to establish their own businesses, contracted by me in a similar fashion to the engineering consultants. So unintentionally, my virtual architectural practice model has become, as coined by the NCARB about our practice, an incubator of solopreneurs. I mean, I just wanted to start a firm with no cash, and all of a sudden, I'm an incubator of solopreneurs. That was pretty fun. Each participant, project manager, interior designer, CAD technician, etc., performs the task that they have declared they both do best and enjoy the best and are not placed in positions to perform work for which they're not suited just because they happen to be on the payroll. This has proven to be a great benefit to our clients because they get role fulfillment experts comprising their project teams. The virtual architectural practice model is ideal for millennial and Gen Z professionals who prefer flexible work arrangements, allowing for a healthy work-life balance, 
where parents can raise children while working from home and the recreational minded can go for a hike or a swim in the middle of the day. The model also addresses issue of gender equality and pay equity in that my collaborators individual fees are negotiated and contracted for on a project by project basis. Excuse me, let's see. We're here. I know that I'm not saying anything new to most of you, but with today's social networking, it's just not that hard to be found. So by embracing a social media mindset, I do virtual networking and blog posting at flexible times. And amazingly, I have not had to do any traditional marketing for nearly a decade now since initiating my virtual practice. We've gone viral. And my virtual company functions just fine while my wife and I travel the globe in our travel decade of our life, periodically tapping into readily available Wi-Fi, often while vacationing in far off locales like Cambodia or Peru. I never told anybody we were going and no client or consultant ever noticed I was gone. My virtual architectural practice is now in its 10th year of existence, and I'm in my 44th year of the profession. The fact that the model is quite amorphous, growing and shrinking with the market economy like an amoeba, takes away the stress and fear that overhead will ever outpass revenue, especially comforting now that we may be entering into another deep recession on the heels of the COVID-19 crisis with inflation as the cause this time. And this uh, particular inflation would be the fourth of my career and the very first one where the firm I'm associated with is simply not at risk of failure. Resiliency indeed. If the projects are there, the talent to perform the work is contracted collaboratively. If not, no one is let go. No one is fired. No one gets angry. There are just no HR issues. So for me, my virtual architectural practice is not about legacy or having a large market valuation formulated for a future sale of the business. The profits have been enjoyed and invested all along the way. My collaborators have learned to keep their individual firms profitable, utilizing the same techniques that I use. And I'm confident that they will be successful long after my firm ceases to exist. So when it's over, it's over. And once the firm passes, I personally choose to remain a lifelong collaborator and mentor for the architecture profession in a capacity and a manifestation yet to be determined. After all, I've had lots of practice. Okay, so a couple of the important things. So this is from the AIA Trust. While I'm certainly no lawyer or insurance agent, I do want to discuss very briefly some of the legal and insurance issues involved in virtual practice. The AI Trust has experts in both areas on staff to advise architects on how best to avoid risk. There are a variety of ways to practice legally as an, a virtual architecture firm. You can form a sole proprietorship, a C or an S corporation, or a limited liability company. But please note, a partnership is not recommended by the trust for virtual practice. Your company can have employees or collaborating contractors. By initiating a virtual practice, you have to change the way you think about firm management. State boards of architecture require the company as well as an individual to be licensed to perform architectural services, and the licensed professional has to own 51% of the firm. Staff working remotely must clearly understand their roles and they need to be self-starters, whether employees or independent contractors. I've always let the needs of the project and a very strict project delivery schedule solved this for my firm. <laughs> and of course, please consult with a trusted agent to obtain adequate insurance coverage. The practice has to take great care in how the staff are classified. Those designated as employees work within their traditional roles within the company and receive all their legal benefits. If instead you choose contracted collaborators, then contractor means independent of your practice, just like your engineering consultants. 
They must be free of your direct control and must have their own separate legal businesses. By this time, all practitioners are accustomed to protecting their firms from cyber threats, but as you can appreciate, a totally virtual firm requires extra vigilance. So consult a trusted IT consultant. Take care to put in place employees or consultant agreements to also protect the firm from intellectual property. Um, please visit the AI Trust website, the guide to virtual practice in its entirety a very helpful way to establish your own version of the model. It's on their website. Now, as promised, um, other virtual firms. Look I, don't, look, I don't believe that the virtual architectural practice model is the only way we'll manage the business of architecture in the future. There will be many new and creative methodologies developed. And that's the point. Your practice is a design problem. So please remember, out of crisis comes opportunity. Study the projected social changes likely to result once the new normal arrives, then create your own response and jump. And in the wrap up, I'm pleased to briefly introduce you to other virtual practitioners who did just that. Located in California, Jennifer Kretschmer also had the notion that she could have a fulfilling custom residential architectural practice with little or no overhead. Here's her timeline. Note, uh, though forming her own bricks and mortar firm in 2003, her practice wasn't initiated virtually in two, until 2008, having tested the waters three years earlier. Her first project outside of California was just three years ago. And she has a wonderful custom residential focus. Her basic structure is similar to mine. Her firm is a sole proprietorship with independent contractors. She calls them ICs as the staff. Mine is a limited uh, liability company. Uh, Somebody needs to mute. Uh, like me, Jim, Jen is home-based, uh, but she can also work in any location with a simple Wi-Fi connection. She has chosen to be a member of a co-working team uh, in, uh, in case she needs face-to-face -face meetings. I've not had to do so. Jen's office designs 100% residential projects, both single family and multifamily, 15,000 square feet or, or smaller. At the present time, her firm will occasionally undertake commercial work. Her revenues right now are about a third of mine. And she obviously enjoys her entrepreneurial freedom as much as I do. Uh, there is, however, a big difference between our firms. Jen contracted collaborators are all licensed professionals, and the number of annual projects is significantly less than mine. We're currently up to our 78th job number for 2021, and our staff size averages around 12. The contracted staff for both our firms have the freedom to be selective about the projects on which they choose to participate. Because of our, our collaborator teams are independent companies, their work schedules are not mandated by our firms. Both Jen and I are the architects of record for our projects, and we maintain responsible control. In our virtual practices, our independent contractors work for multiple clients. I never, ever ask who else they might be working for. Why? Because it's none of my business. Her motivation in creating her virtual practice was spot on with mine. Only it was my collaborators who had the young children. Mine were all grown and gone. The pandemic obviously did not affect her at all and it didn't phase me either. Uh, like that, uh, oh, excuse me. I like that she is training her clients in virtual practice. I'd never thought of that term before. Uh, but in over 10 years, I've never had a client ever asked to swing by my office or ask me how many employees I have. I mean, that's just crazy after having worked in traditional practice for most of my career. Also located in California, Leah Beyer attended my A18 uh, AI National Convention presentation on the virtual architectural practice model and followed up with me afterwards for some mentoring advice. And just look at what she has accomplished. 
Leah's firm is for, focused on large commercial multifamily projects. Later in 2018, the very same year we first met, and in her 30s to boot, she formed her own virtual practice. <laughs> but Leah is a rock star. This year, only three years after forming that practice, she acquired a very long standing architectural firm who had practiced traditionally in a bricks and mortar format for over 40 years. And as soon as she acquired them, she immediately required them to go 100% virtual. Amazing. Leah has a huge social mission, uh, advocating for affordable housing within Silicon Valley, one of the toughest, least affordable housing markets in the country. And her work is highly focused on sustainability. She grew up, she grew very rapidly from a mid-sized firm and then leapt to become a large firm. Uh, she's an S Corp and with multiple shareholders. And of course, I'm an LLC and I'm the sole member of my LLC. Uh, she also has traditional employees on the payroll, fewer in number than my approximately 12 contracted collaborators, but double my gross revenues with an incredible portfolio of projects. Beautiful stuff. She has a similar geographic range of remote staff as I do, but hers is very much a recognizable architectural firm structure, as you can see from her description. She just happens to be a firm, with, a firm without borders. Her team appears just as happy as Jen's and mine. Look at all those smiling faces. So when the time is right for you, get out there. Uh, there are plenty of collaborators in the world to help you along the way. So that's it. Please feel free to reach out to me directly. My contact info is right there. And if I can't answer your questions, I will pass them along to my other presentation collaborators who can. So you see, I even have collaborators for my presentations. Thanks so much. Thank you, Peter. That was fascinating stuff. Um, we're gonna move on to our third presenter, Greg Strollo. And just a reminder that questions can be posted down in the chat and we'll get to those right after um, Greg's presentation. Thank you. I think I'm unmuted. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Very good. Thanks. Well, first of all, let me start out by saying I'm entirely unprepared for this. I was expecting Peter and uh, and uh, Paul to go over and I wouldn't have to do anything and the time would have been eaten up. But here I am and I have to fill it up. So uh, our firm, Axiom, is a collaboration of three firms from Northeast Ohio that realized at some point that it was really hard to compete for commissions of much substance, yeah. particularly publicly funded projects. A lot of times the critical mass necessary to do larger work uh, was just really hard to establish in small towns in Northeast Ohio. As you who are working in some uh, larger metropolitan areas uh, and gobble up all the good talent, uh, it's really hard to recruit kids out of architecture schools to come to small towns in Northeast Ohio. Having said that, uh, the three firms, both uh, Strollo Architects, BSHM, and Phillips Canic, which are the firms that make up our, our collaborative, we have uh, 18, 19, 20 people in one office, 12, 13 people in another office, but together we have a critical mass of about 50 folks and 20 some registered architects, which really does allow us to compete for some larger work. Having said that, we each maintain our individual offices, but have this umbrella firm, which when we jointly agree, we decide to pursue uh, publicly funded larger work um, as Axiom Architects. Um, having said that, we're still kind of in the, uh, I don't know, I call it the first inning, inning of this. We started talking about it about five years ago and just realized that we were all beating each other's brains in to pursue some work together and hardly calling it a, a monopoly. We decided it was better to pool our resources and have a broader spectrum of skills, talents, and people available when we want to pursue some more high profile work. As a result of this, we have received a couple of commissions. Um, I'm going to stop for a minute and say 
each of our firms still values the individuality of our individual firms greater, I think, than the collaborative. The collaborative is a tool to have in our toolbox to use when we um, deem it appropriate to pursue um, publicly funded large work almost exclusively. We're not chasing uh, rec room additions or homes together. Uh, we're doing, um, trying to get state funded work, higher education work, uh, some school systems that might be doing larger projects when it's required to have that critical mass. Um, I found it interesting, Paul, Paul thought his 65 person firm was mid-sized. We would think of that as enormous here in Northeast Ohio, uh, sh short of Cleveland. Cleveland and Columbus have some larger firms in the Youngstown Warren Regional Airport, the or Youngstown Warren Regional Market, the uh, largest firm is I think 20 people. Um, having said that, we are able to now compete with some of these mid-sized firms. Um, we each, each member of our collaborative had sort of a specialty so that we didn't compete too much with each other. It was an easy marriage to make. One of the firms has a great deal of hospitality background. That would be Phillips Sicanic. They do a lot of food service and hospitality. BSHM, another member of our Axiom Collaborative, is very skilled in uh, education, particularly K-12. Uh, we all have a little bit of a higher education work, which helps. And our firm, Stroller Architects, had a long history in uh, healthcare work. And probably 50, 60% of our work is in that area. But together, we've been able to pursue some higher education work that we would otherwise not get to the table for, and we've had some success. Um, I think that first slide up was a, a project that was a um, actually an office for the Regional Builders Association, which was kind of a, a sort of an endorsement that we did the right thing. The Eastern Ohio and Western Pennsylvania um, union contractors have a large builders association that has, I don't know, hundreds of general contractors as members. And when they went to select someone to design their corporate office building, they recognized that we brought a unique set of um, skills to the table and it allowed them to kind of get the best of the regional architects working together, rolling in the same direction. That's really what our, our collaboration is all about. Um, this was not um, an easy thing to do from a business formation standpoint. Um, we had to work with attorneys and, and accountants for over a year to figure out a way to do this where we could all uh, legitimately run our separate practices and also work under this umbrella firm. Um, the slide that's up there now is a rendering of a project that's just now starting uh, to go into construction documents. It's a, can't really see the, the label blocks out the main uh, part of the building, but it's a, it's a performing arts center for a local high school, about a $15 million job that was really kind of easy for us to get as a group. It would have been each of us beating each other's brains and trying to get it as individuals. Um, but the complications, the legal and accounting complications were probably the biggest hurdle we had to uh, get over because of the ownership. As it turns out, each of the principals of the owners of the individual firms are the owners of the collaborative firm. Uh, in our fantasy world, there'll be a day when there may just be Axiom Architects and that the three firms all throw their resources under one umbrella, which would allow us to further take advantage of things like uh, reductions in um, insurance costs and accounting costs and having one HR uh, firm. But the, the benefits though have been to pull from the individual firms, each of the skill sets that, uh, that we can now bring to the table, for example, um, pursuing a large school system that would, had a real emphasis on a uh, innovative uh, 
food service area was something that Bruce Sikanik's firm, PSA, had a great deal of experience in. And uh, we had BSHM that had a lot of experience in K-12. And we had some performing arts experience that was very appropriate. So it was an easy way to bring the strengths of these firms together to go and pursue that sort of work. Um, culturally, things are different. We have uh, one firm has a time clock. They punch in at eight in the morning and punch out at five o'clock. Uh, our firm has no such thing. I'm not sure who's going to be here when I come to work. Um, <laughs> sounds irresponsible. We we have the screens up so that we know when people are working on their project or not, but we allow people to work from home. And if their kid has a dentist appointment, they work till six that night. Uh, it's pretty loose in our uh, firm. And I think the third firm uh, is probably somewhere in the middle there, a little more regimented than us and a little less regimented than the other. Um, it's It's been a, a, a real adventure seeing the strengths and weaknesses as a firm. We've learned a lot from each other in terms of marketing and um, even sort of the graphic skills of each other have uh, been shared and raised the sea or uh, kind of used the rising tide raises all ships. I think all of our work has improved by working with each other. And it also was kind of a, uh, it's proven that it's not like the old days of the cavemen when your self-preservation instincts ruled. And if there was a, um, I don't know, if there was a kill in the, in the, in the uh, jungle, whoever got to it first got to keep it and eat it and the other two starved. Uh, we've learned to share and respect each other. It's been a good thing. Um, with that, um, these uh, shared resources have been recognized by some, uh, mostly by the Ohio, I hope I make sure I get it right, the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission. The requirements to pursue some of the work when you're chasing public works will have a minimum mass. Uh, you might need to have 10 or more registered architects. Most firms in our part of the state don't have that. We do now, and we are allowed to check off boxes like that. The real benefit, however, has been with our uh, umbrella firm, we have four locations so that when the proximity um, is measured, to the distances from some of these sites. A lot of times uh, we will be able to qualify for the highest proximity points that we otherwise couldn't. We have offices in Columbus, Warren, and Youngstown, which cover most of the, I don't know, I guess upper half and uh, the Eastern and Northern part of the state. Um, and really from Columbus, we can get to just about anywhere. Um, I, I enjoyed, Paul's observations that uh, a Cincinnati firm would be considered local to Youngstown. I'm glad it was. That's a five hour drive. We wouldn't think of that locally that way. We would, uh, when we get outside about uh, an hour, we charge mileage. I'll bet that's something that larger firms don't have to think about too much. In, in our smaller world, it's important for us to be on site within an hour, which is something that we can do out of these multiple locations. Uh, having said that, these uh, this idea that working together while working apart sounds like something that was COVID driven, but it wasn't. It was really just kind of learning to get along with people that used to be our, our uh, competitors. Now they're much more friendly competitors. We have this umbrella firm and it's allowed every firm to benefit from it um, in many ways and allow us to qualify for some work that we otherwise wouldn't have qualified for. That's really the basis of what I have. And with that, I'll turn it back to Charlie. Great, thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. Uh, very nice presentation. So um, now it is time for some Q and A. First of all, thank you for um, those presentations, um, everyone. So Greg, Peter, and Paul. Um, so I don't see questions in the chat. Um, if, if you have one, please go ahead and enter it or speak up. Um, so let's, let's go around and talk just a little bit more about how you find your collaborators. Greg, it sounds like you knew your collaborators. They were your, your competition, basically. Uh, but Peter is probably in a different position. Peter has to find collaborators kind of around the planet. 
um, at least that's the, the graphic, right? So how do you find those folks, Peter? So I, it's just the same answer as what I said about marketing. Um, I used to be the rainmaker for all the firms where I was either principal or partner or something. So I, you know, over 10 years ago, I'd spend my day driving around the state of Ohio making cold calls to school superintendents. I look back on that now as the biggest damn waste of time I've ever seen. I have not had to do any marketing, like I said in my presentation. The same thing for collaborators. The second we were a virtual firm, I had a flood of inquiries from all over the country about people who had heard about this way of practicing architecture. And I got to the point where I, I treat those first phone calls just this way. First of all, please send me a resume. And I can just hear the word, the, the, the churning in their heads. Oh, this guy's no different than anybody else. Uh, and then I ask just two questions. What is it in the architectural delivery process that your peers tell you that you do best? Are you the project manager type? Are you the guy that wants to put on blinders and detail the heck out of the project and please leave me alone? Um, are you the guy that loves all the new G whiz software, uh, especially true of the kids that are still in school and beta testing all of that stuff, right? Um, um, and then I ask them, what part of the architectural delivery project do you like to do the best? And in 10 years, those two answers are always exactly the same thing. And so I have a whole folder of potential project managers. I have a whole folder of senior CAD technicians. I have a whole full, a folder full of interior designers, graphic designers, uh, 3D CAD specialists, uh, 3D renderers. And so, Every time I have a project, once I figure out what I have to have talent-wise in order to fulfill the client's expectations and program, I just go to my, my files and ask them if they have time to do it. And then I, I, I know I'm going a little too far on the, question, on the answer to the question, but this is really important from a business standpoint. The next part of the process to get them started sounds laborious, except we're not in the snail mail world anymore. And so here we go. So I, I select a project manager. I first ask them, do you have time to do the project? Because they have their own companies. If the answer is yes, I'll email them a scope of work and a schedule. They'll send me a proposal. I'll send them a contract. They send me the executed agreement. They'll then deliver the work on time because I, I don't accept anything else. I told you that's how I drive efficiency and profitability. Um, and then uh, I, they send me a, an invoice and I send them a check. Now that was a whole lot of back and forth, but that takes 24 hours except the time to do the work in this day and age. So that's my answer. Thank you, thank you. Um, Paul, you talked a little bit about how um, you would make a split in all of the phases of project delivery from DD through um, CA. How important is that? And is that a relatively new thing for you guys? Well, I'd like to say, I mean, I think it depends on the project and it depends on the client and it depends on the kind of environment that we're finding ourselves in. Um, we do tend to partner like that because, you know, we're, we're kind of more unique in terms of when we do exhibit design, um, we'll be, you know, competing with three or four companies, no matter where we are in the country, we're competing with the kind of handful of people. Um, but when it comes to architecture, we're competing with a lot of architecture firms out there. And there's just, so when we find ourselves in a place like we were in the project in Louisiana, where I talked about that, we knew that there was going to be capable people down there and they were going to be like this one already involved to some degree. And we, it wasn't going to bode well for us to be like, no, we don't work with other people. We only work by ourselves. You know? So we took this approach that, okay, yeah, we're happy to work with you guys. And we learned a little bit more about their firm and we talked to them. And in this case, it made sense 
we kind of got along with them. We wanted to make sure that they were involved in the beginning so that that, that kind of led to us giving them a portion of every phase thinking about, and then giving us a portion later saying that, okay, we definitely think the project will benefit from having you involved during the conceptual <laughs> design discussions, even though we're going to lead those discussions, we're going to all benefit from you knowing the story, knowing the history of the design. And then when it gets to CDs, you know, they're going to be the ones, you know, really putting the manpower into it. And we're going to be um, on the phone just saying, yeah, no, that looks good. That, that makes sense to change, but we're really trying to do this for this exhibit over here, that kind of thing. Um, and so in that case, we did, we kind of, you know, we've other, other projects, we have split the fees based on um, the relationship like that. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say it's project by project. Um, and to, I think it may be new to some people, but I think for us, it's, we're always collaborating far away. You know, I'm working on a project right now in Shenzhen, China, Children's Museum there. And so it, we have multiple people around in the, and we're not going to be doing all the phases in that one either, just because um, partly it's not allowed. We're not going to be able to do the construction documents in China. But that's, um, again, that's a, the way that, you know, we find each project is a little bit different and we just try to keep an open mind. Um, take a, a little a little different approach. So in Peter's presentation, you showed a screen capture of a, a meeting at OJK. And I couldn't help but notice that everybody except for one person was was female. And so that <laughs> kind of leads me to suspect that this kind of collaboration might actually be a boost to equity, diversity, uh, inclusion. Um, it, was, it was easy to see in that one. Are there other um, aspects to that, maybe Greg or Paul, that uh, you've, you've found an increase in your, your diversity and outreach because of these collaborations? Mm. Uh, not specifically with respect to diversity. One of the unintended benefits of the uh, Umbrella Corporation that we had is uh, there's some sharing uh, that goes on between our firms. If one of us gets, say, hectically busy and the other one might not, we've actually just traded staff, sent them, sent them to the other firm, which is a sort of a, a bonus and, and a comfort level that we have after having worked with each other. I, I did want to point that out. That's been a benefit to all of our firms. Uh, we're comfortable working under each other's roofs, which there were days when, you know, would have lock the door if we saw one of the other ones coming towards us. So it's been a good thing. I think that, you know, when we're putting a team together, uh, it depends, you know, there's a certain amount of um, experience with a teammate that you want to bring to the team and say that you have this experience with them. But we found um, like using Natalie, that there are, there are benefits when you have, a small role that we need to fill that's in a place that's near a, a project that we're not near. And so it does give us the ability to kind of look at a bunch of different firms, contact a bunch of different people and find somebody who we think is a good fit, who we think, you know, maybe we've never worked with before, but we like what they do. We want to work with them or we see that. So yeah, we definitely see as, as everything evolves, we see the diversity um, just kind of always growing and changing. And it, and it has been, it has, it does allow us to do that when we're kind of rebuilding teams every time it's a nice uh, opportunity to branch out. Hey, hey Charlie, if, if I might, um, um, the profession right now uh, is so focused on uh, gender and racial e equality, um, uh, sexual orientation equality, uh, social justice. And from day one, over 10 years ago, practicing virtually has drawn um, uh, those that whose personal lives uh, demand more freedom. Uh, and it has given incredible flexibility, especially to young families and to young mothers um, uh, who don't have to sacrifice the mobility of their profession and the, the upward mobility of their profession uh, by having to pause and not work at all uh, the way it used to be in the traditional workplace. Um, I uh, just got back from San Antonio, Texas, where I, I made a similar presentation to the Texas Society of Architects at their national convention uh, over the weekend. And 
Um, I, I, you guys need to help me from AIA Ohio on this young lady's name. She's another national rock star. Pascal, what's her last name? She did the We Lift Up or something exhibit in Ohio. Anybody helping me here? Do you guys know who I mean? Young African-American young lady who's, uh, I think she's just 40 years old and she's already a fellow. But her whole mission nationally is to increase minority participation in architecture by uh, providing early exposure to it um, and also to, to have more females involved in the profession. And I'm so glad that both Jen and uh, Leah in the, in the slides they sent me chose to show who their collaborators were and, uh, and that one, uh, one young man working in, uh, in, on Jen's team, you know, he needs to get out there and find a, a, a little bit of uh, male participation. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. That's a good perspective. Uh, Bruce, I see a question from you in the chat. Do you want to, you want to share that? Well, there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, I think networking has been one of the, the biggest things that all of this is about collaboration. I think that we have found that that really starts with the AIA. I, I mean, uh, that's been the basis of, of most of our connections. We, we, right now have a separate section in our SRQ that deals with collaboration and it, it's page after page with different firms that we work with on our projects. So I, I think, you know, just being part of this conversation and, and the AI take advantage of that, I, I think is, is, is one of the talking points. And as Paul pointed out in, in his presentation, um, you know, it was Peter Kuttner who I got to meet a number of years ago and, you know, back and forth with AIA issues. And, you know, as they were looking to Cleveland or Youngstown for, for a local architect, it was Peter who, I think I know Bruce in Youngstown, you know, so uh, it, it's one of those things that, you know, those connections um, actually do work and, and they really do make a, a difference. Uh, there was also one other thing I wanted to throw out uh, uh, that on the comments that Greg made, and that is um, opportunities to staff through collaboration. Um, when you have firms like ours, so there's um, food service and hospitality, or Greg's that's you know focused on on um, the medical uh, uh, areas and or education from BSHM. Uh, by collaborating, we're able to take our employees and take them out of their their comfort zone and put them in other areas of work um, on projects that normally they wouldn't see. And and I think that it expands their opportunities, their experience levels, and and, and allows them to grow a little bit more. And I, I think that's something that's our responsibility. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes just because of our specialties, we kind of you, you know hold them back a little bit. And I think by collaborating, whether it's the way Peter does it, or or Paul, or, or uh, how you know Greg and Axiom, it, it actually allows um, um, that educational process to continue across the board for everyone. So, so I think that's a big benefit of of working in some type of collaborative process. I would agree. And Peter, would that be Pascal Sablan? Yes, that's her. Okay. You're muted, Charlie. Thank you. Sorry. So, Greg, your um, your approach is just a little bit different. It's not as as virtual. You've got uh, brick and mortar stuff going on. So, was was starting that expensive or difficult or um, kind of what's the the top three items on a checklist to get that done? Uh, legal and accounting was a little bit difficult and had some costs, but everybody already had their own real estate, so that has not been a factor. In fact, there's been some discussions of even sharing common real estate and condensing into a single space. Uh, so that opportunity is out there. I don't know that that will ever happen, but it's a distinct possibility. Um, I think anytime we can um, share, collaborate, uh, whether it's space, people, jobs, it's all good. Uh, the pie is big enough for everybody. There's a lot of work out there. We have to get over this idea that it's all or nothing in the, uh, as Paul's uh, collaborations with Bruce and others has gone with, we, again, I'm referring to those in smaller market areas, we uh, must collaborate with uh, larger firms for projects of significance for major uh, clients. It's just a, a given. 
Uh, I would not trust a new hospital, even though we're capable of doing it to us without some help. Um, it's just not going to happen. Nobody's going to spend a half a billion dollars with an eight person firm. If they do, they're probably wrong. We better have some critical mass back there. Got it. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so I think we might be wrapping up. Um, anything anything for the good of the order? Thank you, Peter, um, Paul, and Greg. Uh, this has been a great discussion. I appreciate your, your sharing your insights and your projects and uh, your connections. So if there are no other questions, I Pleasure. believe we are done. Thank anything? you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Greg? Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate Thanks. it. It's like fun. a rock band or something, right? Yeah. My name <laughs> should no be Mary. Mary. I, Peter Paul. I needed a Mary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Bruce. Charlie. Yeah. All right. See Take care, everyone. We appreciate it. Okay.